Hello viewer to History Unraveled. Underground in New York, a 160-year-old coffin was found in 2011. It's a Tuesday function as development laborers clear an empty parcel in Elmhurst, Sovereigns, New York. Middleburg was the name of the first settlement in Queens County, Elmhurst, which was established in 1652 by Dutch colonists. Middleburg was an area close to New Amsterdam, as it was called at that point, yet by white individuals. 1664, named Middleburg Newtown, at last became Neustadt. The Newtown's gift to America was the apple, Pippin's Newtown. The natural product is said to have been coincidentally developed on the place that is known for a Brit named Gershom Moore at some point during the 1700s, and at that point, the apple was very famous, in spite of the fact that it is seldom developed today. Newtown is a huge piece of Sovereign's province and turned into the region's seat during the 1680s. In 1876, the Long Island Railroad constructed a track through the town, marking yet another development. Cord Meyer, a landowner, proposed changing the county's name in 1896. Elmhurst was given to the project the following year. However, let's go back to the construction worker in Elmhurst in 2011 who stumbled upon an odd occurrence. What was found was a body, a white shirt, and knee socks. Scott Walker Nash, then a prehistorian with the New York City Clinical Analyst's Office, reviewed the revelation that October day in a meeting with the New York Post. A wrongdoing was recorded and a body covered in an unwanted spot sounded perfect. Lauren Nash addressed the paper, yet that is not a wrongdoing. Albeit the body was very much safeguarded, the individual he professed to be was not dead such a long time. This is the body of a covered north of 150 man a long time back. The spot of love was Street Imprint's African Methodist Episcopal Church, and the four purchased the property it was on in 1828 for $75. Furthermore, this thus turned into the home of the Unified African People Group and filled a double need as a position of casual love until the actual congregation was fabricated. Unexpectedly, the four men who purchased the land, whom we know just as Coles, Doyle, Johnson, and Peterson, were totally liberated slaves. Then again, New York itself was the initial segment of North America to import African slaves. As a matter of fact, it was the Dutch who originally carried captives to the nation and carried 11 Africans to their country. Also, after the English involved this domain in 1664 and called it New York, they just expanded the quantity of slaves in the state. Toward the start of the 19th 100 years, there were four to ten ranches in the city. Furthermore, as we have seen, after a year those four liberated slaves purchased the property in what was then Newtown Sovereigns. Around then, Newtown was where previously oppressed Africans laid out a flourishing local area with its own congregation, Street Imprints African Methodist. Episcopal Church stayed at its unique area until 1928. The congregation actually exists today, presently on Northern Road in Jackson Levels, Sovereigns. During the main development of the congregation in 1928, the assemblage attempted to uncover and reinterment the bodies in the burial ground. In particular, individuals from the congregation requested that nearby specialists rebury the departed at Mount Olivet Graveyard in Masfet. Sovereigns. In any case, eventually, just the collection of Song 20 was covered on the Mount of Olives. What's more, in 1886, the quantity of individuals covered in Street Imprint's congregation burial ground was assessed at around 300, and that implies that a large portion of these bodies are most likely still in that vacant field today. It was one of the bodies covered around 1850 whose grave was unintentionally uncovered by laborers in 2011 with their excavator. What's more, as we saw, we saw the teeth of the tractor hit the metal thing first, which really seemed like a line previously, hauling it out, uncover the body well. Legal excavator Scott Warren Nash made a point toward the start of his examination. I found metal pieces that are exceptionally particular. Lauren Nash really tracked down up to 60 bits of broken iron. What's more, this specific coffin, 
as per Warren Nash, was made by an organization situated in Fortune, Rhode Island called Fiskin Dump Raymond, whose iron coffin configuration was licensed during the 1840s. In this manner, the lady whose body was coincidentally uncovered is designated Woman of the Iron Casket. In any case, at the two shows in New York, the American Foundation Show and the Syracuse State Horticultural Society Show, the things were not modest, selling for $100 each, yet the then standard pine boxes were $100, only $10, two USD. Be that as it may, there are two justifications for why caskets are famous with the affluent. However, there is a more sinister explanation for these coffins' widespread use. Normally, these strong iron final resting places were accepted to hinder grave burglars. However, Fisk himself was initially an iron heater creator, and the kettle producer had his own explanations behind making the caskets. He kicked the bucket in Oxford, Mississippi in 1844, not a long way from the graves of his family in New York. Fisk's dad, a strict man, was profoundly disheartened by the change. Hence, Gas Metal Box was conceived, with Fisker collaborating with Raymond's father by marriage under the organization's name. Yet demise isn't far away from us. Fisk kicked the bucket in 1850 at 32 years old subsequent to laying out an ironworks at Winfield arriving on Lengthy Island. The body found in Elmhurst was so very much saved in light of the fact that it was contained in a metal box in Fisk. Since Warren Nash was in the body, which he presently knew was a young lady, he dreaded there were risks in keeping up with this mystery. There are numerous different islands, and you can see that he found the reason for the lady's passing, and that her body was very much safeguarded from the ulcers that were the principal side effect of smallpox. The body was so all-around protected that I'm not shocked the malignant growth was restored. Lauren Nash told the New York Post. As Warren Nash anticipated, the post-mortem uncovered that the lady had malignant growth and that the infection had spread to her cerebrum. Luckily, the analysis showed that smallpox was at this point not serious. For instance, Warren Nash estimated a woman's age at death between 25 and 35 years old by examining her skeletal system. Be that as it may, Lauren Nash needed to find out about him. However, Warren Nash put in a lot of effort throughout his career. Additionally, a comprehensive survey of locals revealed that leisure time is beneficial. Just 33 individuals have that capacity, said Lauren Nash who added that one was more ready to take conception prevention pills than others. This was an African-American lady named Martha Peterson. In 1850, when he was around 26 years of age and presumably passed on around 1851, he was residing in the home of William Raymond, Fisk's accomplice in iron box maker, Raymond Lauren Nash. Raymond Lauren Nash, accomplice. Lauren Nash was right. Martha Peterson is additionally accepted to have filled in as Raymond's servant. How should a lady who filled in as a servant during the 1800s manage a $100 coffin? As a matter of fact, Peterson resided in William Raymond's home, and you can see the reason why this little man was covered with distinction. Raymond was an accomplice in the fifth final resting place business, so all things considered, he gave the casket. Also. This supposition that is upheld by the way that the imprint on the casket is topsy-turvy, and there is a mistake that could imply that this final resting place can't be sold. Warren Nash remained curious even after the woman in the iron coffin's identity was revealed. What did this lady really resemble? While the facts confirm that Fisk's serotide iron casket worked effectively of safeguarding Martha Peterson's body, her face was still seriously deformed subsequently. Sadly, his head fell and was harmed when the earth mover hit the final resting place. Martha's skull and the left half of her face were so severely harmed by the earth mover that it was difficult to determine what she resembled. So the archaeologists brought in another master, Joe Mullins. He is a legal imaging master who often works with the FBI on wrongdoing and missing youngster cases. Mullins is an expert at creating pictures that show how people change over time. Mullins then played out a CT filter, zeroing in on the right half of Peterson's face, since the left half of his face 
had experienced the most harm. Making sense of his method for the New York Post, he said, on the off chance that you take a gander at the skull, you can tell where the eyes are, Mullins kept, adding that Lynn realized Martha Peterson was an African-American man, so she depicted him as having earthy colored eyes and medium skin. I chose to give it some color. I saw this lady become completely awake on screen, seeing the face of a woman who passed away nearly 170 years ago is special. Furthermore, for quite a long time, her body stayed in an empty parcel. After Martha Peterson's body was not scheduled to be exhumed, members of the church that is now known as Street Marks African Methodist Episcopal Church held a memorial service for her thanks for watching Don't Forget Like, Subscribe and Like.